Good day. Welcome to the Sunday School presentation for the fourth Sunday in June, June 26th, 2022. Uh, this is the last lesson under Unit 1 of our summer quarterly theme. The summer theme is Partners in a New Creation. Unit 1's theme is God Delivers and Restores. And our lesson today comes from Isaiah again, the 51st chapter, verses 1 through 8. It is entitled, God Offers Deliverance. Let's bow our heads, please, in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you again that your divine providence has brought us to the beginning of another week. We thank you for the morning worship experience, and we thank you now for this opportunity to study your word in church school. We ask, dear God, that you would give us clarity and focus, that we would remove every vain and idle thought, that we might be able to hear clearly from you, that we might be able to discern what your word is saying to us in our own unique personal situation, that we might be able to grow from this experience and be better stewards of your gospel in the future than we have been in the past. Continue, dear God, to bless and keep the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church and every church that is open in your name. Help us to use this time in the wisest manner possible. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask it all. Amen. We have been in Isaiah now for the last several weeks, uh, and this lesson uh, seems to wrap up what this first unit uh, has been dealing with, which, which has to do with the restoration of Judah after uh, it suffered uh, exile and chastisement and discipline from God for uh, its sin, for uh, its turning away from God. The assumption of deliverance is that it is a transference from something bad or something negative or something deadly to that which is good and positive and helpful and life affirming. That's the picture that the prophet wants us to take away from this portion of the writing. Continuing with the promise of deliverance to those that will experience the horrors of chastisement and exile, God reassures the recipients of this prophecy that the punishment will not last forever and that the restoration that will proceed from it will be lasting and will leave us better than we were before. That was the point that we were trying to make in last week's lesson. It was not just the promise of deliverance, but the promise that you would be delivered into something better. In Isaiah chapters 51 and 52, the prophecy contains several imperatives. There is a call to listen, to awake, to look, and finally to depart. Some of these commands occur in immediately doubled form. That is, the writer says the same thing twice, which is always an indication of emphasis in emotion on the part of the writer or speaker. There are also rhetorical questions and many great statements about God and the promises of what he will do. Just as a reminder, this part of Isaiah comes from what is called by Bible scholars Second Isaiah. Uh, it occurs many years after the first and major portion of Isaiah has taken place and it has to do with God's restoration of Judah after the Babylonian exile exile, which actually becomes the Medo-Persian exile, because after Babylon overran uh, Judah and Jerusalem, the Babylonians themselves were overrun by the Medo-Persian empire. But the promise here is that restoration will take place. And here in our printed lesson, God tells us what this restoration will look like, and God confirms it with his own words. There 
there's a great deal of usage of personal pronouns in this passage. As has been the case in, in, in the last couple of lessons, the lesson is really very brief. You can take it in large chunks. The, we're going to look at it in three large chunks, verses 1 through 3, then verses 4 through 6, and finally verses 7 and 8. So let's look at Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 3. Listen to me, all you who are serious about right living and committed to seeking God. Ponder the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were dug. Yes, ponder Abraham, your father, and Sarah, who bore you. Think of it. One solitary man when I called him, but once I blessed him, he multiplied. Likewise, I, God, will comfort Zion, comfort all her mounds of ruins. I'll transform her dead ground into Eden, her moonscape into the garden of God, a place filled with exuberance and laughter, thankful voices, and melodic songs. The prophet calls for maximum attention. He, he, he opens by saying, listen to me, all who are serious about right living and committed to seeking God. The concentration of both the literal ear and spiritual attentiveness. The call is to those who fear the Lord. And by fear, it does not mean to be afraid of, but those who have awesome respect for who God is and what God has done. The people are to reflect on their origins as this will encourage them as they wait for God's deliverance of them from the Babylonian exile. When I say their origins, reflect on where they came from, where God had brought them from. The Lord had brought Judah into being from small beginnings in fulfillment of his promises. Thus, it is implied that he's still able to translate his word into awesome activity. In other words, God is saying, if I did it before, I can certainly do it again. The Jewish Midrash, which is a commentary on ancient Hebrew scripture, on this first verse reads as follows, and I'm quoting. When God looked on Abraham, who was to appear, he said, Behold, I have found a rock on which I can build and base the world. Therefore, he called Abraham a rock. Some commentators suggest that this midrashic interpretation may be at the heart of Matthew 16 and 18, where Jesus identifies Peter's confession that he is the Christ as being foundational to the formation of a new covenant church. The reasoning is that just as Abraham's faith in God was a pattern for the ancient Hebrew community that proceeded from him, so that of Peter and the apostles would lead to the building of the church. I think that that's good reasoning on their part. God's promise to Abraham included a land as well as a people. Go back and read Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 8. Though the capital of that land, Jerusalem, now lay in ruins, the promise of God is for restoration. God will comfort by transforming Judah and giving her a voice to praise him. God confirms this promise a second time, picturing Eden to describe the transformation that is to take place. First, he talks about Abraham, and then he talks about, I will transform her dead ground into Eden. Eden being the paradise from which humanity was initially spawned. What does this say to us? What, 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 what uh, uh, can we draw down from this passage that is helpful to us in our contemporary times? The sovereign power of God 
is clearly the subject of this pronouncement. The sovereign power of God. Sovereignty is something that, that, that means God can do whatever he wills to do. God is not limited by human constructs. God is not limited by human expectations. God is not limited by cosmic circumstances. God is transcendent. He is above all of that, which means God can do whatever he says he will do. Thus, we can have complete confidence in what God says because God is the one who said it. All that's required of the recipient is a serious commitment to seek God. The same is true of us. Restoration of the human heart through the transforming work of the Redeemer is assured for those who will seek and surrender to God through his Christ. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. Pay attention, my people. Listen to me, nations. Revelation flows from me. My decisions light up the world. My deliverance arrives on the run. My salvation right on time. I'll bring justice to the peoples. Even faraway islands will look to me and take hope in my saving power. Look up at the skies. Ponder the earth under your feet. The skies will fade out like smoke. The earth will wear out like work pans. And the people will die off like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My setting things right will never be obsolete. Do you notice how many times there are personal pronouns used in this section, in these verses? My, me, I. It's used repeatedly, presenting a vivid impression of the personal activity of God on behalf of his people. God will manifest his own righteousness to those who pursue it. If you go back to Isaiah 42 and 1, God declared that his law would go out to the nations, creating justice among them. The first servant song shows that the servant redeemer is the mediator of this divine justice. Here we see that the law, Justice, righteousness, and salvation of God are all widely disseminated throughout the nations. This combination of terms suggests that there's going to be a thorough reordering of human life among the nations on the basis of God's own character revealed in God's law expressed in God's righteousness and taking the form of God's salvation or deliverance. Salvation and righteousness are closely parallel ideas here, providing a background for the Pauline doctrine of salvation and righteousness. Turn in your Bibles uh, very quickly to Romans chapter 1. And look at verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It's news, I'm, I'm reading from the message version. It's news I'm most proud to proclaim. This extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him, starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what scripture has said all along. The person in right standing before God by trusting him really lives. I, uh, Isaiah's passage uh, is, is 
seemingly on Paul's mind as he writes these words because it shows that salvation and righteousness are tied together and they are linked by our willingness to commit to the power and the sovereignty of God. The prophet calls on Judah to consider the universe. He says, look at the heavens, look at the earth, look at all of the things that I created. And, 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 and he says, these things which look so stable are less enduring than the salvation that God promises. What that says is that not only is God capable of bringing these things to pass, but when he brings it to pass, it has a permanence. It has a perpetual nature attached to it that no one can shake. And that's what Jesus is. The picture that is presented here helps us to comprehend just how important we are to God. Think about that. He says that the salvation and the righteousness that is provided to us, that is accommodated to us, is more lasting than the heavens and the earth. Some scientists say that, that, that the earth is hundreds of billions of years old. And if that's the case, the prophet says that God's concern for us extends beyond that. That, that, that God's concern for us is greater than heaven and earth. When heaven and earth have passed away, when they no longer exist, the, the, the guarantee of our salvation is still assured. And it is guaranteed by God himself through the gift of his Messiah, his servant, his redeemer, our Lord Jesus the Christ. Finally, let's look at verses 7 and 8. Listen now, you who know right from wrong, you who hold my teaching inside you. Pay no attention to insults, and when mocked, don't let it get you down. Those insults and mockeries are moth-eaten from brains that are termite-ridden. But my setting things right lasts. My salvation goes on and on and on. In the final portion of our printed lesson, the prophet substantively repeats what he has already said in verse 1. There is a close link between righteousness and the law of God because the law presents God's right way to humanity. The heart is where God's law should be. Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 30, verse 14. The heart is where God's law should be. And the new covenant pledges that it is, that is will and indeed written there. Let me say that again because I did not say that well. The new covenant pledges that it will indeed be written upon our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. The prophet here assumes that the righteous in the land will experience antagonism from the wicked which finds its ultimate illustration in human antagonism to the Christ servant of God. Like the visible universe, wicked humanity, God says, will perish. The only abiding realities in God's new order are his own righteousness and salvation. And verse 8 repeats this assurance from verse 6. So the promise of the passage is that God will deliver and the guarantee of the deliverance is God's own word. 
God says this of himself. Don't overlook the usage of personal pronouns in the passage. The my, the me, and the I usage in the passage. Because it is God declaring this of himself. And there is no greater, no better, no higher guarantee that we can have than the guarantee that comes from God himself. If God says he will deliver, then God will deliver. If God says he will restore, then God will restore. And the promise is that what God restores is better than what we had before the restoration took place. Well, God, thank you again for this time of sharing. We pray that what has been said and done here has been pleasing in your sight and edifying to your people and uplifting to your holy and righteous name. As we prepare now to go into our mid-morning worship, we ask that you would go with us, that you would provide relevance, meaning, and purpose to what we say and do. If there's someone sharing with us in worship who does not know you in the pardon of their sin, we pray that something that is said or done would cause them to surrender their lives to you. We ask it humbly in the name of your son, Jesus, and for his sake we pray. Amen. Please plan to share with us in our mid-morning worship at 11 o'clock. God bless you.